Hey everybody, it's me Jill and welcome to Jill Informed. This is the recap of The Real Housewives of New Jersey, Season 13, Episode 3, Boys Will Be Boys. Is Bravo not even saying to be continued anymore or did I miss it? Because we are picking up exactly where we left off, like almost right in the middle of a sentence. This is, we are at the mozzarella party and Teresa and Melissa are, you know, having their little disagreement, shall we say, on how they remember the seating arrangement going down at Teresa and Louie's engagement party. Teresa again says, I'm in, thank you, and Joe were like rooting for me and Louie. Melissa, really? Nobody opened their arms to Louie more than Joe and I. I mean, that's not true. And then she said, just so you know, I want to see your happy ending. I mean it. I really do. And Teresa goes, I feel that. (laughs) Okay, thank you. And Melissa goes, and by the way, I'm good with the engagement party. What I wasn't good with was if I looked like a liar. So that I had to correct. But I'm fine with that. And I'm fine not being in the wedding. Teresa, listen, do you want to be in the wedding? I mean, like if you would love to be a bridesmaid. Side note, nobody loves to be a bridesmaid. (laughs) Okay. Melissa dodged a bullet, if you ask me. Melissa goes, why are you acting like you're doing me a favor? Teresa's like, I'm not. I would love for you to be a bridesmaid in my wedding. Wow. What are you getting all that enthusiasm from your daughters? Anyway, Melissa basically tells her that, yeah, it's too late. Not interested in being your sloppy seconds or your last minute choice. So, but it's fine. She's like, I swear it's fine. And Teresa's like, okay, thank you. And then they tell each other that they love each other and they hug. Okay, now we are at Dolores' house with Dolores and Polly. And Polly says, where's Mr. Potato? Dolores, <laughs> Polly, he's coming. We have to get this last photo shoot done, but I haven't seen him since the hospital. Flashback to when Dolores tells Margaret that Frank's not going to be here because his bowel stopped working for seven hours and 36 minutes. Dolores, I heard he lost a lot of weight, Polly. So what, is he a French fry now? Oh, wow. He is committed to that Mr. Potato Head analogy. As you recall, Frank called him Buzz Lightyear. So, you know, it's all in the Toy Story family, I guess. Polly's retaliation is to call Frank Mr. Potato Head. All right, so Frank is going to be Mr. April for the sexy calendar, and he will be portraying the Easter Bunny. The first thing I notice as Frank walks in the room is that he's carrying a can of Pam. So apparently he got the memo about oiling up first. So after some good-natured Toy Story ribbing between the two men, Frank announces that now that his bowels are working at full capacity, you know, just pumping out all cylinders there. He is planning a guy's night out and he's inviting Polly. And Polly says that he will possibly attend. In Frank's confessional, he said, the more time that Polly spends with me, the more he'll see like, God, I'm not a threat. And then our family can go back to the way it used to be with me spending every waking moment with Dolores. Side note, whose house is this supposed to be? Dolores's? It looks like a model home that hasn't fully been staged yet. There is not a stitch of anything on any of the walls. They're just all these bare walls. There's like an old sofa in one area. And then just like a bunch of garbage, like the props that she has for this photo shoot on the counter. Other than that, there's like one thing of like fake flowers on the kitchen counter and then nothing no window treatments it's like somebody moved in and spent all their money on buying the place and they can't afford to furnish it is that what we're looking at here (laughs) anyway Polly comes on a little strong with frank i think Polly had this intention that he was going to tell frank the next time he saw him that he's got dolores now and that, you know, Frank can back off. And I think that was probably in his head because it didn't 
It just felt like it came out of nowhere, like the strength with which Polly is, you know, coming at Frank, especially because all Frank did was invite him to a guy's night. Frank kind of implies that Dolores might have been sort of keeping the two of them away from each other, but they should get to know each other. And I don't know, maybe this is in defense of Dolores. Polly kind of comes hard at Frank. He's like, well, you can't send a woman to do a man's job. You could talk to me directly. Everything doesn't have to go through the Dolores, and Dolores doesn't need that. It, it was like, whoa, <laughs> you know? In Frank's confessional, he goes, what the f*** was that? I don't even have his phone number. How else am I supposed to reach him other than through Dolores? All right, so the photographer's here, and it is time to oil up, just like the real Easter Bunny does before delivering eggs. And then out of nowhere, Frankie Jr. appears wearing a suit and white gloves to rub Pam into his father's beefy chest. Because that's normal. Next, we are at lunch with Margaret, Melissa, and Jackie. Jackie is making strides with doing better with her eating, and the ladies all tell her how great she looks. She looks super healthy, which she actually really does. And it's funny because I didn't really think she necessarily looked unhealthy last year. She looked very thin, but it isn't until now that she's starting to actually get nutrients into her body that you can actually tell the difference. Just like in her complexion and everything, she really does look healthier. And I'm super happy for her. No matter what you think about Jackie, good or bad, I'm happy that she's on the road to recovery here. Jackie's like, so tell me about this cheese making party. Cheese making? You mean mozzarella making party? Jackie doesn't understand why she wasn't invited. She's like, you know, I met Danielle maybe twice and there was no issue. And Melissa goes, well, she said you kind of looked her up and down, Jackie. Well, first of all, I don't do that to anybody, but I did look her up and down. (laughs) But can I be honest? It's because she was a train wreck from top to bottom and I couldn't look away. Yeah. Then she proceeds to criticize her short saying, and I quote, they look like something she just pulled out of the hamper. (laughs) If she had a problem with me, she could have just called me. What? Why? I wouldn't have called you if you were saying that about the way I was dressed, and believe me, she would. There's no part of me that would have called her to, like, talk it out. I would just be like, okay, well, that person's not for me. (laughs) And also, I think we all have to agree that Jackie is judgmental now, right? (laughs) Margaret, well, if you want to insult anyone, it could be Jennifer Aiden. She is in a downward spiral. I was just trying to have an adult conversation with her, and she just starts getting very offended. So then Melissa says that she sees something very weak in Jennifer. Margaret, of course, agrees. In Margaret's confessional, she said, no one who's happy with her life overreacts the way Jennifer did. These ladies all seem to agree that Jennifer needs to deal with her marriage. I thought she dealt with her marriage last year. I guess not fully. They all say they feel bad for her, although they're not acting like they feel bad for her, but they all say they feel bad and that, like, something's off. Okay, next we are having a little photo shoot with Gianella, Rachel and John Fuda's two-year-old daughter. It's her second birthday. And in Rachel's confessional, she tells us that when they first got married, Rachel got pregnant and then they were out to dinner and she could feel something wasn't quite right and she miscarried. And she was never able to get pregnant again. So apparently these two littles that they have, Gianella and Juliana, the three-month-old, are with the help of IVF. So Rachel is saying that she's got five more eggs frozen and she wants to use them like pronto. John is a little reluctant because, you know, Gianella just turned two and they have a three month old baby at home. So John would like to wait a year maybe, but Rachel is no, now is the time. Now is the time. I don't, you know, she's only 31, right? So they actually really do have time. They could wait a couple years, but uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, whatever her reasons are, she just wants to have them all now. Maybe, Maybe she just wants to like have, I think she said something about wanting to have four children. And, you know, she's they have their son, Jaden, from uh, John's previous marriage. So yeah, that would make four children. And then maybe she's done. I don't know. Okay, next we are at Teresa's house, and we find her in the meditation room, and she's journaling and and 
chanting her daily affirmations. I am true to myself. I am strong. And then Gia walks in with a tray with a salad and bottle of water on it. Gia tells us that she's going down the shore and she needs to eat something first. So she takes a bite and she goes, Mom, you would love this. You want to try a bite of my salad? And Teresa goes, no, thank you. I still need to lose 10 pounds before the wedding. Gia, um, it's salad. Now Louis walks in the room and sits down, and Teresa starts to tell them that at the mozzarella party, she was telling the ladies that she was thinking about open seating for her wedding reception. Teresa. And then Melissa brings up the engagement party. No, actually, she didn't. Margaret did. Margaret was making a joke. Everyone's like, yeah, open seating is fine. And Margaret said, yeah, it's probably even better because, you know, the last time you had seating, there was an issue. I don't think Melissa would have brought it up, to be honest with you. I could be wrong. Maybe she would have. But you know what? We'll never know because she didn't. Margaret did. But yeah, Teresa is telling her family that Melissa brought it up. So of course, their reactions are based on some misinformation already. And Teresa goes, she was like, oh, you said I lied. And she is like, and Louie goes, this coming from the liar herself. Teresa, like, why bring this up months later? She didn't. Margaret did. Gia. It's just sad that she has to try and make up this lie to make you look bad. Then Gabriella, my favorite Judice, comes into the room and she sits down. Teresa, Gabriella, I'm sorry. I know you don't like to get involved in all the drama and stuff like that, but I was just saying that I ended up talking to Melissa at the mozzarella party and she kind of pulled me in. Gabriella, well, how did you leave things? Teresa, like coming to an understanding. And I actually asked her to be at my wedding and she said no. Gia, I wish you wouldn't have asked her that because not for nothing, but like you're still upset with the fact that she said that she was there for us. Now we get a flashback, or it's not really a flashback, but we get a little clip of Melissa's podcast where she and Joe were talking about the time that Teresa was in jail. You can hear Joe saying that the entire time that Teresa was in jail, Joe Judice wasn't working at all. They had no income. And then Melissa said, yeah, that Teresa went to prison show was able to be made because Joe needed to make some money and he needed someone to film with. And here we were. We jumped right in. Okay, so that's kind of disgusting. I just think the fact that she's like putting this out there like, oh, how benevolent of them, you know? First of all, it's family. And yes, they went to prison because they did something wrong. I'm not like excusing that. But also the girls. It was just like these poor girls didn't ask for any of it. They didn't do anything wrong. They never, first of all, never asked to be on this show. But they... They didn't commit these crimes. They didn't know what their parents were doing. It's not their fault. And yet here they are stuck in the middle of this where their parents have to go to prison, you know, one right after the other. And Joe and Melissa should have just been there to help their nieces and not act like they were some kind of saviors for doing it, you know? Okay, so you had to film with him a little bit so that he could make money to, you know, feed the kids whatever. It's just like, just do it. You don't have to talk about it like you're so wonderful. That kind of turned me off. Plus, Gia says that the only time she saw them is when the cameras were rolling. So it's even more like disgusting. (laughs) So Gabriella says, why did she say that? And Gia goes, to look like a good aunt. And Gabriella goes, yeah, but like in what context? Louis, attention, attention, trying to get attention. Okay, Louie, you weren't even there, buddy. I think Louie needs to know when to step out of a conversation. Like, if it's trashing their aunt, maybe step out. That's not your place. And Teresa goes, yeah, because, like, you guys would come and visit me every week and tell me who was there for me. 
Gabriella said, it's hurtful because that was about five years of my life. It was a very sensitive time, and especially because it's not true. We remember who was there for us, and credit should not be given when it's not earned. Okay, so um, Gia used to be the absolute adult in the room at all times. And I loved that kid. She So much was put on her, too much was put on her as a child to, uh, you know, be the voice of reason and sanity. But as of late, I really feel like Gia has gotten in the drama a little bit. And she has become a mini Teresa in many ways. But Gabriella, that kid, at least at this point anyway, and during this scene, I believe her. I don't think she has like, you know, an agenda or like hatred in her toward her aunt and uncle. I just think she's being honest. And according to her, they weren't really there for them when Teresa was in jail. So I kind of believe her. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Also, I believe her because this scene is making her break out in hives. Teresa's like, oh my God, look at her neck. Thanks, mom. If you're a 17-year-old girl, you're on camera, it's making you nervous anyway, and now your mom has to point out that your neck is getting all red and blotchy, not cool, Teresa. Yes, she did look like she was getting a little blotchy, but still not as red as Louie's face. Don't embarrass her. So yeah, Teresa's mad now. And Melissa is her godmother. How dare she even say that? Louie doesn't think that Melissa does anything without her husband knowing about it. He thinks that those two, Melissa and Joe, are in complete sync and they are trying to hurt Teresa. And she is like, I know. Then he leans over and he's like, are you okay? To Teresa, who's like beginning to tear up. Gee, I don't know, Louie, you just accused her only sibling of trying to destroy her life. So mm, maybe she's not okay. So now everyone in the room is pointing out how sad it is for her that he's her only family. And Louie's like, I can't take it anymore watching this man act out this way. Like, dude, you think I don't see you? I see you a mile away. Okay, calm down. You're in the meditation room, for God's sake. Also, guys' night should be fun, huh? <laughs> Next, we are in New York City, and Danielle is meeting Melissa, who is meeting with a vendor, and Melissa is on a buying trip for Envy. I guess Danielle is interested in having her own store for children's clothing. She's very interested in learning the process from Melissa. This scene is very reminiscent of when Melissa tagged along with Margaret when Margaret was buying for her store that she had at the time. I don't think Margaret has that store anymore, right? Isn't that what she got sued over? Like the logo, the whale logo and all that. But Melissa was wanting to start Envy and Margaret like was showing her the ropes, I guess. So now the student has become the teacher. And she's showing Danielle what the buying process is like. Okay, so Danielle's store is going to be called Bougie Kids. Because, you know, I just realized the thing that I love to do the most is dress Valentina. All right, so now Melissa tells Danielle that she had lunch with Margaret and Jackie. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, wow. Melissa is not holding anything back. She, like, almost immediately tells her about the hamper shorts. Danielle goes, oh. Well, then I'm glad I didn't invite her to the mozzarella making party. She was just jealous of my legs. In her confessional, she goes, I called it, though. I called it. She's a judgy bitch. Judgy bitch. Then they start talking about Melissa and Teresa's thing and, you know, what went down at the mozzarella party. Danielle tells her that that thing going on with her and Teresa hits her a little bit differently because she's the sister that doesn't talk to her own brother. Then in her confessional, we get the whole backstory to that. Apparently, Danielle and her brother were very close. And then the pandemic happened. And Danielle started to see these like TikTok or Instagram videos of people doing like brand reviews. And she thought, oh, I could do that. I could make millions doing this. We do see part of one and she's all, she's kind of silly and, and goofy. Hey, 
It might have been cute. I don't know. We only saw a little tiny bit of it. So anyway, her brother sees them and he starts making fun of her for it. So she blocked him. Now, according to Danielle, she was like, it's no big deal. But, you know, like he doesn't have to look at it anymore than if he thinks it's silly and stupid. So she, you know, I just blocked him. Like, it's no big deal. So he called her and said, did you block me on Instagram? And she goes, yeah, you weren't liking those anyway. You were making fun of me. What's the big deal? So he says, oh, yeah, well, you're out of my wedding. I thought it was a joke, but it wasn't. So now Melissa's like, it went from he was making fun of your little videos and you blocked him and then he said you're out of the wedding. I feel like I'm missing something. (laughs) Yeah, I think we all are. That's quite a leap, right? Danielle, well, yeah, there was like some things like when he was planning his wedding. I tried not to put my two cents in. Melissa, but you did. (laughs) Now, remember, Melissa is like Danielle's brother's wife, right? That's her part in this story. So she's pretty sensitive to the wife's plight, right? Danielle goes... I mean, you know, that's what happens. Again, in Danielle's confessional, she's like, I don't have a blood sister. So like, it was exciting for me. I wanted to do things for her with the wedding. So she overstepped. And her brother's wife had to say, it's not all about you, Danielle. Danielle. So I told her, I'm the type of sister that if you do something wrong, I'm going to tell you. Because I'm never going to have my family break up. Ever. So she sent a text to her brother saying, I see now who I'm dealing with. And from that text message, he kicked them all out of the wedding. Now, by all, I assume she means her husband and kids and her. Not his parents, too, right? I don't know. So Melissa's like, when was the wedding? Two years ago. And she hasn't spoken to him since. Danielle, I personally think it's the wife. (laughs) Of course you do. Melissa, Like I said, obviously triggered. But if your brother is the one saying, you're silly, these are stupid, these videos are stupid, etc., give that to him, Danielle. But for two years now, if his wife said, I think you should probably talk to Danielle, maybe he would listen. Oh my God. She is Teresa. Don't assign any responsibility to the man. Oh no. It's his wife's responsibility to tell him, you need to talk to your sister. What? Look, that might be traditional, Italian, whatever, but it's not right. It's not fair. If that's the tradition, then the tradition needs to change. Women need to start holding their men responsible for their own actions. Stop giving them a pass. Melissa's answer is, I tried. I always tried to get Joe and Teresa back together. But unless Joe wants to, Danielle, really though? Oh my God, she doesn't really believe that Melissa tried. She's like, I don't want Joe to end up like my brother. And Melissa goes, he's a grown man though. I can only try so many times. Okay, over at the Aiden house, Olivia is still in her nightshirt because that's how she rolls. I'm a kid and I can get away with everything, she says. Then Jacob, their 13-year-old, asks if he can have some friends over to hang out. And Bill said, yes, but you have to clean up after. And he goes, really clean. And Jennifer's like, yeah, they very sloppily clean. I think we need to have the kids do more chores. And Bill's like, absolutely. (laughs) Jennifer, so what's minimum wage? $13 an hour? I'll pay you minimum wage. (laughs) What? Immediately, Olivia negotiates for $14 an hour, and Jennifer agrees. Bill looks stunned. (laughs) Like, what just happened? He agreed that, yes, the kids should have more responsibility and do chores around the house. And in the blink of an eye, he's hired five employees at $14 an hour. Bill's like, I think we need to scale back a bit. Hmm? Then Jennifer and Bill give like dueling lessons on how to wash dishes or really anything. Jennifer tells the kid how to do the chore and then Bill corrects her. So that's fun. Now now the kids are off doing the chores and Bill and Jennifer sit down to talk about the mozzarella party. Jennifer tells Bill how Margaret approached her. She tried to tell me I was disingenuous, Bill. And then she tried to say I wasn't self-reflective. I'm like, I'm the most self-reflective person here. I'm sorry, I am. 
Do you think I am? You know me better than anyone, Bill. Bill. Um... It's a yes or no question, Bill. Why is it so hard? You want my honest opinion? Jennifer, yes, of course. Bill. Okay. We all have personalities that are different. For example, you spoil the children too much and I like to sleep hanging upside down. At times, this is what happens. Are any of us perfect? In Jennifer's confessional, she goes, Why does Bill always have to be the peacemaker? I don't want to hear. Oh, when one wants to look at themselves, blah, 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 blah. Shut the f*** up. I don't need my husband to validate the other person's point of view. I need him to have my back. Bill, you can acknowledge part of it. Jennifer, which is what? What's my part in it? Bill, so you are a self-reflective person. (laughs) And Jennifer goes, I'm over it. I'm good. We're done. Don't sweat anymore, Bill. (laughs) Next, we are at Danielle's house, and she is having a little art show for Valentina, her four-year-old, because the art show at her school got canceled due to COVID. So she has invited her parents. Big Phil arrives first, and he's got flowers. Then her mom, Angel, comes. She's got her own flowers. And Big Phil and Angel have been divorced for a while. Danielle says that ever since her son, Dominic, was born, and that was seven years ago, she had never seen her parents like in the same room together and getting along. So the birth of their grandchild kind of at least has allowed them to be cordial with one another. So I have to tell you, I thought this was going to be like, well, I didn't know what was going to happen, but this art show is a Adorable. It is stinking adorable. Valentina shows her artwork and then she tells us what artist had inspired the work and what is like a, a cornerstone of like their work. And oh my God, she's so cute. So cute. Um, so after the kids go off, uh, Danielle says that she's sad that her brother isn't there because normally that would be something like he and his wife would have come to that too, you know? And then her mother said, you know, we reach out, we tried. It's not like we're we're not trying. And Danielle tells us that her mother hasn't spoken to her brother either for like two years. Oh, and now her dad starts crying. Her father's the only one that has maintained a relationship with his son. He just wants his children to get along. That is sad. And now I'm wondering if because brother disinvited Danielle and her family, I wonder if her mother didn't go to the wedding because he wouldn't let Danielle come. I'm just speculating. I don't know the story, but that makes me really sad. Okay, next we're at the shore house of Melissa and Joe, and their whole family is there, and she's expecting her mom and her sister. What the? Gino looks so old. Like, I think he's 15. He looks like he's about four years older than he was last year. (laughs) That's just bizarre to me. He just always seemed like he was a little kid running around, you know? Anyway, he's wearing a t-shirt that says Virginity Rocks. I guess it's a brand or something. I don't know. I never heard of it. Joe kind of laughs about it. And Melissa goes, well, I like it. I happen to think Virginity does rock. And I think we should talk to your sister about that. Oh, God. Melissa loves embarrassing her 17-year-old daughter. All right. Anyway, um, her mom and her sister get there and they sit outside to have salad or lunch or something. And Melissa asks her mom and her sister if they were invited to Teresa's wedding. Her mom's like, no, we didn't get an invitation. And Joe's just kind of sitting there stewing. His mother-in-law goes, did you think we would? And he goes, yeah, I did. Joe Judice's family was invited to our wedding. So, um, I mean, to be fair, I, they probably weren't feuding like this either. I mean, obviously something's going on with them and it makes the situation a little bit more complicated. I am not siding with Teresa and Louis. I'm just trying, you know, I like to try and see both sides. And it's not like they're perfectly fine with each other and she ignored Melissa's family. No, they're having some issues. Joe points out how much his parents loved Melissa's family and how good Melissa's family was to his mom and dad. Then he says that his dad's last words were that he wanted Joe and Melissa to love each other. Love each other. How did I miss doing no-no? Two weeks. You'll 
not come see me. You don't call. So Melissa's sister is like, you know, you should talk to Louis. And he goes, I have. I sat down and had a talk with him in New York. And I said, I want this to be better. You should tell my sister to admit that she's wrong and apologize. (laughs) Oh, okay. Is that what you said? I can't imagine why that didn't go over well. He said that Louis said that's never going to happen. She's never going to do that. And Joe just thinks that Louis is making everything worse. And then Melissa has to tell them that Louis called me insecure. You know, you were starting to act insecure, Melissa. (laughs) Like, let it go. It was stupid. It was a stupid comment. You know you're not an insecure person. So, you know, maybe let it go. Unless it's striking a nerve. So then Joe's like, yeah, and you know, we got this guy's night coming up and... Melissa's sister goes, well, what are you, you going to do? And Joe said, I'm going to tell him I'm not into this bullshit. Oh, okay. And it is time for guys night right now. All right. Everyone get ready to bro out. Frank, Joe Benigno, and Joe Gorga are the first three there. So far, so good. Looks like tonight's going to be a lot of laughs, people. <laughs> what could go wrong? Then Evan and Bill, uh, they talk about ordering shots and this being like an initiation for the new guys, Nate and John. And I guess John Fuda has already been talking smack to the other guys, like he's going to drink them under the table and all this. You know, I said that, I said it before, like I worry about Joe B because he's like 65 or something. Don't try to keep up with the others with the drinking and everything. I worry about the older ones. Oh, and here comes Nate and John. John Fuda now. John Fuda is carrying a gift bag and he said, oh, I brought something for you guys. And he pulls out a package of adult diapers, some Pepto-Bismol and a bottle of Tums. And Frank goes, (laughs) funny thing is I could use all these things. But yeah, it gets a big laugh and you know, he is fitting right in. Like I said, everyone is broing hard right now. There's shots. There's laughter, good-natured ribbing all around. Then Frank learns that Polly's not coming. I think Joe B. told him that. And he's like, why not? And I think he said he was working or something. Frank relays the conversation to the guys about how Polly told him not to send a woman to do a man's job. Frank, he's like he uh, is almost questioning my manhood. My whole family dynamic has changed because of this guy. Dolores is never home. She never calls anymore. You, you, are, you know you're divorced, right? <laughs> and you have a girlfriend. Joe Gorga, do you miss Dolores? Frank, I miss my relationship with Dolores. Yes, I do. And Joe goes, then why did you let some man come and swoop her up? Excuse me, does he not have a girlfriend? What about Brittany? Bodybuilder Brittany. Is that her name? <laughs> Frank said that he wants Dolores to be happy. So I, I, I didn't interject my feelings because I want Dolores happy. Then they ask if Louie is coming. And Joe Gorga said, I don't know. Ask Billy. He hangs out with him all the time. Bill. Hmm, I do. I love Louie. I'm the brother-in-law he never had. <laughs> Joe Gorga's like... There you go, Bill. Joe, why don't you be a little nicer to Louie, hmm? Joe Gorga, me? When he came around, we took him in with open arms. My wife, Miss Insecure, treated him better than royalty. Okay. I mean, come on. Bring it down a notch. That's a little extreme. I seem to remember your wife... I guess we're calling her Miss Insecure. Actually, both of you just trying to keep your mouth shut because all these horrible rumors were coming out about Louis. So I don't exactly think that's open arms, the royal treatment. No, you kept quiet about the horrible rumors. I don't know. I guess that is the royal treatment. Then Joe said, I just found out my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law are not invited to the wedding. John Fuda. No way. Everyone's like, that's wrong. It's family. Bill. Well, you guys do have some unresolved issues still. And Joe Gorga goes, I just want him to know you're a piece of shit. You're garbage. And here comes Louie. What's up, guys? I don't know what Louie's new job is, but is it located on the sun? God, that guy's red. He is perpetually beat red. 
All right, so now we discussed bachelor party plans. Louis comes up with this like ingenious idea that I've never heard of before. It's quite unique. Why don't the guys all get together and go out and then the girls can get together and go out and then we'll all meet up someplace at the end of the night? Joe B, no. John Food is like, this guy wants to meet up with the wives at the end of the night? Joe B, are you kidding? Frank's like, I don't have a wife to meet up with. So then in the worst segue ever, because it makes absolutely no sense, Joe Gorga said, if you have a bachelor party, who are you going to invite? I thought we were talking about the bachelor party. So what do you mean if you're having a bachelor party? Louis says, why are you asking, Joe? I'm asking because you're having a wedding, right? Yeah. You're inviting a lot of people. Louis, a few. How many? Louis, 200. Why are you asking, Joe? Close people? Louis, yeah, family, friends, Joe. You met Melissa's family. Good people, right? Louis, yeah, great people. Joe, yeah, great people. So I just found out Melissa's family wasn't invited to your wedding. Not very bro-ish, bro, Joe. Everybody's in, but anyone from my side of life, it's f***ed up. Frank, Louis, is there a reason why his in-laws weren't invited? Louis, um, you know, it's a lot of past bullshit. Joe, no matter what happened between Melissa and Teresa, Melissa's family, the way they treated my parents, you got to give them respect. So then Joe B said, you know, it's really a slap in the face not to invite them. It's an Italian family. I'm Italian. I know how that works. And Joe goes, it's like a f*** you. You mean nothing to me. And Louis goes, well, there's a lot of slapping in the face going on on both sides. Joe, who's slapping who? Louie, your wife goes on social media and says that Teresa's kids wouldn't have food if it wasn't for her. And Joe goes, no one said that. What we meant was I called my sister every day to check in on her. I checked in on those kids. I was there for her. And Louie goes, I live with your nieces. They talk about it all the time. Joe, they talk about one thing. Louie, no, they talk about a lot of things. Joe, you don't know shit. Bro, you've been here for one f-ing minute, Louie. I've been in your sister's life for almost two years. And Joe's like, just shut up. You should be embarrassed for talking about this. And Louie goes, you're on a podcast talking about your sister. I'll sit here and say whatever I want to you. Joe's like, oh, you're a tough guy. F- you. I mean, all the broing has gone out the window at this point. Joe's temper is heating up. I mean, you know, he's still not as red as Louie, but he is getting hot. They question each other's manhood. Are you saying I'm not a man? As if being a man is such a great compliment. Now they're going to break each other's balls. So much talking about the balls. Joe Gorga, my wife's not in the wedding. Fuck you. Her family's not in the wedding. Fuck them. Louie, Joe, 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 Joe. Teresa is my fiance. Teresa is 50 years old, puts her foot down and says who she wants to have at the wedding. She doesn't want certain people. What do you think I should do? Joe, a man would tell my sister that she's out of line. Louie. So I just did that. Your sister wanted to stand her ground. That sword should not fall on me. Joe Gorga. That's f***ed. John Fuda. Here's the thing with Italians. The older sister is supposed to stay with you and guide you just like the mother would. That's just the family dynamic. How it's supposed to roll. Joe Gorga. I'm f***ing hurt right now, bro. I'm hurt. Frank. Louie, he's hurt. He's hurt, Louie. Louie. I know. I can see that. I see you're hurting, bro. But let's be fair. Your sister doesn't deserve to hurt either. You guys really should talk, Joe Gorga. I'll be honest with you, bro. I don't feel comfortable. I'm afraid of getting hurt again, bro. Louie, your sister deserves to hear how you feel because what you feel is justified. You also should hear what she feels too and end it. In Joe Gorga's confessional, he says, what would that even look like? Teresa will say, you didn't defend Louie. Because that's what she always says. She does not move forward. Um, yeah, he's right about that. I don't think sitting down with Teresa is going to do much. But he does tell Louie that he will think about it. But, you know, he's hurt, bro. He's hurting. The New Jersey bro is a sensitive breed. I will say that. And that is where this episode ends. (laughs) 
Thanks so much for being here. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you have yet to subscribe to my channel, please consider doing so. Also, if you click on that little bell icon, you will be notified every time I have something new to post. Also, if you're going to be doing a little Amazon shopping this week, in the description below this video and every video, you will find links to various items in Amazon. If you click on any one of those links, you can purchase whatever you want, and I will get a small portion of any qualifying purchases. So thank you in advance for that. For those of you who are clicking on super thanks down below and providing me with tips, thank you very, very much for that. I appreciate every single one of them. I love you guys, and I will see you next week. Bye.